Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Museum of Russian Art, to our virtual program, uh, a walkthrough with the artist of our current exhibition, uh, Andreas Stanislav Cosmist Reconstructions. And before that, before I introduce Andrea and give you the floor, I would like to say a few words about our current programs. We have three exhibitions right now. Andrea Stanislav in the main gallery, the Tkacho brothers, traditional Soviet era uh, oil paintings by some of the prominent Soviet artists, Sergei and Alexei Tkachev on the mezzanine. And we have our annual fabulous holiday show downstairs in the lower gallery. And uh, also I would like to say that our museum is supported partially through memberships. So you are most welcome to become members and support our programs and events and other activities. And with that, I would like to say, uh, uh, just to give you a short introduction to Andrea. Andrea Stanislav is a contemporary artist who is also an art educator and college professor. I met her when she taught at the U of M, University of Minnesota. She was a professor of sculpture. And at that time, it was at least five year, five or six years ago, right, Andrea? I visited her studio and was fascinated with her work and wanted to, um, have an exhibition of her work here. Andrea moved to uh, the University of Indiana and she is now, her time is shared now between Indiana and New York where she has a studio and St. Petersburg where she does a lot of projects with contemporary Russian artists. Um, and with that, I would like, first of all, to thank Andrea for sharing her fascinating work on themes of uh, science fiction, space, uh, space race, uh, the theme of, that fascinates me of Russian cosmism, a unique philosophy that emerged in Russia as early as mid 19th century. Uh, and uh, Andrea, now uh, we, I would love to hear you speak about your art and this exhibition. Thank you uh, so much, Masha. I'm, uh, I'm going to turn off my, my phone here that's making sounds. Um, I'm, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you and the Museum of Russian Art for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it has been a long time in the making. We had a little bit of a, you know, a, a CV-19, uh, I would say, uh, interruption. Um, but everything uh, came together, I think, in a very uh, poetic and uh, I do I dare say sub sublime way working with the architecture of the museum. And as an artist, it has been um, an amazing experience, a very rewarding experience uh, to be so, I, I'd say, to be surprised and unexpected in having this conversation with your work uh, in a particular uh, architectural space. And uh, the, the project uh, has been, uh, uh, has, we've created a, a conversation over the past five years, uh, starting while I was a professor of sculpture at the University of Minnesota here. Um, and uh, my interest in Russian cosmism and science fiction is, is also long standing. I'd say for the past 20 years or so, I've been touching on these subjects within my work uh, as I would say as a child, also as uh, someone of my generation, I grew up with the space race and some of my earliest memories of media and TV are of watching the different, in this case, the US, but the, the, the NASA landings, uh, the, you know, the Apollo missions. Um, and I'm, I'm of that generation where that, was um, really in the forefront of my understanding early on from you know a youngster of like three to four. So there was, uh, I would say, a very sincere interest and even desire, I think, in a kind of uh, understanding that at some point there was a, there was a promise that, you know, in my generation that we would we would reach space in some other more public way. 
And now in 2021, um, to some extent that's actually happening um, with, within the private space programs. Um, but to go, to go back to the work, uh, science fiction also has been uh, an interest of mine. I've been a fan, uh, again, going back all the way to childhood, huge fan of Doctor Who, if anybody's a Doctor Who fan out there, but also uh, the science fiction movies such as Silent Running um, and also a, a film that really struck me early on was uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris. And I think that's also where the Russian uh, conversation the sensibility comes into my work. Um, I was asked earlier today by a friend, how did you start working uh, in Russia or how did the Russian culture uh, become an interest to you? And honestly, when I look back, uh, I would say it was because uh, it, I'm very grateful that my father had a kind of odd VHS collection that had every film that Andrei Tarkovsky made. Um, so it was coming from someone who was more of a American Westerns and kind of crime, lots of Charles Bronson and so forth. So, but for some reason, my father really responded to these films poetically. And I was brought up to some extent, my father was a jazz musician and uh, a, a kind of TV was my, my babysitter, but I chose to watch films instead often. And I really absorbed the films of Tarkovsky uh, from a younger age through my teenage years. And I would just watch and rewatch these VHS tapes. Didn't have conversations with others. I didn't know that anybody else I knew was actually watching these films. It was a little bit of a private artistic, uh, it's kind of meditation. But I believe that that sensibility has entered my work. And that was, I think, one of my early interests uh, in, or my or one of my, I would say, um, introductions to uh, Russian culture was through the poetic uh, cinematography and moving image language of Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh, and he dealt with two science fiction uh, stories, novels. Um, uh, apparently he wasn't really keen on uh, making them when, when, when he was offered these film options, but um, the films have become iconic films in uh, cinematic history. Uh, Stalker, which is based on uh, the Swarovski brothers, A Roadside Picnic, uh, and also uh, Solaris, which is Stanislav Le is a is an interpretation of uh, Stanislav Lem's uh, science fiction novel, the, the Polish science fiction uh, novelist. And, um, and also 2001 A Space Odyssey, I'm a huge fan of Stanley Kubrick, but the cinematic language uh, is a big informant into my uh, 2D work, my sculpture work, uh, and, and, and my video work. So for this exhibition, uh, it was, it, I was thinking of the conversation between all of these disparate pieces to some extent in terms of media, because you have collage, you have sculpture, you have video installations. Uh, there were exciting moments in this iteration of the work being together in the Museum of Russian Art, where, uh, do I dare say, sort of these poetic moments uh, where you have the video uh, in conversation with the vanishing points, a, a, a life-size rotating horse piece with a particular uh, sort of the sparkles that go off, but it's where the re light refraction is also working with the video and the two are creating this moment, kind of this, this media installation together. And uh, there were some firsts, I, I think these conversations in, in the exhibition where the work really uh, came, came together in different ways. Uh, that again, were, was surprising and, and rewarding for me as, as the maker and, and the artist of the work. Uh, we start the, uh, exhibition, uh, you're greeted uh, by what we'll say a kind of a, a work called Troika, and it is uh, three headless wolf forms. Um, they could be wolves, they could be dogs, they, they could be some sort of mythical creature perhaps, but they don't have heads, but they have these mirrored reflective uh, surfaces, these pink mirrors. I use a lot of reflective surfaces in my work. Uh, in different ways to reflect light, to refract light, but to also bring the viewer slash participant into the work. You see your reflection 
and therefore you are in, in a very direct way, a uh, part of the work. You are within the work yourself. Uh, you are within that conversation of the past, present, future, uh, in this case for space exploration and the trajectory of, of, our, of our being, of the sort of human beings we'll say on earth. And um, I think that the, the timing of the show is interesting and in, in that we do have the, the actual Mars trajectory uh, full on right now. Within though this piece, Troika though, the uh, wolves are holding uh, sort of up a, a mirrored orb. It's a stainless steel ball. Uh, it's, 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 the, it's the scale of the uh, Sputnik uh, 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 object actually itself. So there is a, a tie into that. Um, but it also has a text around the uh, with, within the perimeter of, of the of the orb, uh, and it translates into the fairy tale is now our reality, um, and that was a mantra that was used, a kind of slogan, a mantra uh, during uh, Yuri Gagarin's uh, sort of flight. Uh, into space where he became the first human being that we are aware of uh, publicly that, uh, that, that entered space. That was also an apogee uh, within, I'd say, Russian, Russian history and culture within the 20th century. Uh, so that's also uh, in, I think that's woven in throughout uh, the work in, in, in different ways. Uh, they're rotating uh, an overall motif within the exhibition are orbits in rotation. So you have a lot of circles, a lot of orbiting. And that is, uh, again, a, a metaphor for space and for the orbits and that we, we have this cyclical nature um, that, 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 that is iterated out throughout the artwork and, and throughout our uh, lives too. Um, as we uh, move around the exhibition, we also are, uh, we, we experience the collages and uh, the collages are in conversation with the sculpture and videos, again, very directly where images from the sculptures, photoshopped images of the sculptures and some video moments are actually within the collages. And then you will see within the same space, some of the images and the collages in the 3D form and the sculpture. So there's a lot of self referencing in terms of the artwork and the images and the objects. And these objects are being collaged in with historical photos uh, from the US and the uh, Soviet uh, space race during the time. You'll see images of uh, uh, Belka and Strelka, of Laika. Uh, you'll see images of various cosmonauts of the Suez space capsules of uh, Bonacore, of the Star City, um, the launch pads. So all of this imagery is woven into the work in, very, in various ways. Um, they're also set against and behind me right now, you see the mushrooms. And uh, mushrooms are, you know, I, I'd say they're, they're, they're throughout, you know, it's, it, they're celebrated within uh, Russian culture in terms of cuisine, in terms of activity. Um, in, in the fall, you go and you collect mushrooms. Uh, visually, within graphic prints. Um, but also, um, um, one of my first visits to Russia uh, with uh, the curator and director of the Museum of Nonconformist Art, Anastasia Patsy, she showed me a video that really stayed with me of Sergei Karyokin's and it's called Lenin is a Mushroom. So it, uh, I, someone could maybe comment further on this, but it was described to me as kind of our Orson Welles War of the Worlds where there was a media broadcast of a kind of absurd uh, lecture where he, he's, he's showing that Lenin was a mushroom throughout uh, a kind of, um, I would say, didactics and and and, and schematics that, and, and he's in a, a sort of fake professor's uh, 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 university office, um, and and that somehow he does actually make this argument into a kind of a logical 
uh, he sort of answers it in a kind of logical, sensible way where you, you could believe it. He makes, he makes logical sense of this. Um, but within the US, we also had the, the War of the Worlds uh, broadcast by Orson Welles, where many citizens believed that actually uh, alien beings, Martians perhaps had landed. So going back to this science fiction of where is again, aliens, other, you know, beings from another uh, place within our universe come and, and land on earth. Uh, and where the, the public can, can believe that. So, so that, that also, that uh, satire uh, stayed with me, that, that kind, and that, and that conversation too. Um, you are, throughout the work, uh, you are also, uh, you also e experience the Solaris series of works. And I refer to the collages and the Solaris works, which are these glitter constructions as sculpture. A collage for me is an artistic action that I have done as long as I can possibly remember, going back to even being a child, very seriously, sort of more in art school, graphic design classes, and then uh, within my own professional uh, 2D work. And always in conversation uh, with the video and the sculpture work that I'm doing. But that act of collage for me is, is a very sculptural practice. So I call these 2D pieces constructions because for me uh, within the refractive pieces as the image behind me, <coughs> um, you have almost a hand weaving of paper. It's very labor intensive. Uh, there's, it's hand cut papers, holographic and dichroic films and they're interwoven then with layers of resin and with photoshopped images that I cut out on archival papers. And, and then there's, there's a build. It's a, this sort of lo-fi illusion too of a kind of a very sort of 3D uh, focus, ex, uh, fo focus experience for, for the viewer. Um, there's a kind of lo-fi depth to these works. When you see them in person, they're also activated by light. And this activation of light is important throughout uh, the exhibition. Again, as I spoke earlier about reflective surfaces and their ability to re refract and reflect light uh, in different directions at times. And um, also uh, within the Solaris works, um, um, directly, uh, directly uh, re relating and speaking to <coughs> Uh, the film Solaris and the last image within the film where you see the sentient planet in this kind of swirling sort of color mix. It's, it's sort of the, the sea that um, the, uh, the cosmonaut is, <coughs> is, is viewing. Uh, also, these particular glitter works were informed by images from the Hubble telescope of the star constellations and the nebulous uh, forms in space. And upon seeing these when they first came out, uh, you know, this is go going back a few decades ago, but it was, it was an epiphany for me in terms of the color and just the, the absolute beauty of these images. So these very colorful photographic images and I, and I have a, a, a few, I'd say coffee table books with these beautiful images in them, became um, an, an informant uh, to these glitter pieces. They're also circular again. So they take form in either, you can think of them in terms of a planet, they're kind of mandala-like, they can be kind of focus, they can be focus points for sure, but they're, they're also acting for me <coughs> as the maker, they're, they're on black backgrounds, a kind of black mirror, a kind of, uh, we'll say, uh, infinite, uh, the blackness of space is something that I was um, trying to um, access within the materials and using black enamel paint, but with layers of resin over it, again, creating a lo-fi depth. And uh, hopefully there's a kind of lo-fi illusion where they're either emerging from or moving back into this this black ground and uh, that sort of open question as to moving outward and inward was important um, when making these. Um, <coughs> then throughout the uh, exhibition, uh, the sculptures include uh, TMAB uh, and TMAB is a monolith 
Uh, the imagery, the object is directly taken from Arthur C. Clarke's uh, uh, short story, The Sentinel, which was also then uh, made into 2001 A Space Odyssey. I think probably most of us are familiar with the famous monolith and monoliths, uh, the, the T-maps, and that's the scientific name that uh, Arthur C. Clarke gave these objects. And, and within these uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, the, the, the story and the, the film, and the uh, short story of the Sentinel, they really are beacons. And this interested me as markers that would uh, occur. They'd make themselves present in time when there were epic changes uh, within the universe. And I feel right now, um, as a maker, a follower of science fiction and science, that um, we are at one of these particular times. Uh, in the time that recently of 2019 through 21 with as a society globally we, we've we've obviously we've we've gone through an in, incredibly gigantic changes in terms of uh, the way the way we uh, the way we uh, connect with each other and also technology and at the same time we have this trajectory towards Mars which is uh, I feel like it's being expedited you know at sort of great measures. Um, all the time in the news. What, what, are, what are we hearing? <coughs> so um, I feel that these monolith forms um, are, are, very, are very appropriate right now for the time that we live in and sort of using them within the work. There's a black goat uh, that jumps through this monolith and it's mirrored. Uh, I have talked to physicists about the reality of a mirrored monolith and they, they find, uh, I'm not a physicist, but that it's 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 a quite a complex, uh, uh, I would say, uh, kind of problem to solve or um, a, a mathematical equation. Oh, okay, I'm working on data. Okay, one minute. Okay, I have a I have a screen screen share message. My apologies. Uh, okay. Okay. Bear with me one minute. We have a little bit of a technical. Okay. Oh. Let's see. Oh, what did I just tell you? Okay, thank you. One minute. Okay. My apologies. I, I wasn't sure. Oh. Okay. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Let me. Okay. I, this, my apologies. We have we have the screen share on now, so I will uh, bring you through the um, exhibition. And starting with um, this particular image, uh, going back to some of the uh, strategies and the imageries that I've mentioned, um, you see uh, the uh, one of the Suez uh, capsules in the lower left. Uh, you're seeing in this in this sort of female who I regard as a kind of oracle, a seer. I take usually the eyes out there. I use special effect contexts in videos, but where the eyes are mirrored in some way, it's a kind of seer into the future. That's it's, it's a it's an ongoing motif in a number of my works. Um, as we go through <coughs> the exhibition here, this is the TMAB mirror that I was just um, describing on the right. So you have this life-size black goat. Uh, it, this, it's kind of within a morally, I'd say relative universe. We have this um, kind of object of the dark side, dark knowledge uh, jumping through. For me, goats, I use and other animals, raptors, owls, eagles, falcons, horses, goats, animals um, play a particular, uh, they have metaphor and they have meaning within my work and uh, are different uh, particular motifs. So the goat is used 
often as a kind of um, image of sort of dark, dark knowledge moving forward and magic. Um, and we have um, some of the, I call them the black velvet collages uh, in, the, in the center. Uh, there's a series of these. And I, I have to say, uh, currently, they're probably my, my favorite work or my go-to in, in terms of working again off of another black surface and uh, also using the reflective uh, materials and how we, you have these juxtapositions and these sort of these particular bright moments that, that happen within <coughs> the work that are activated by light. We'll look at some of those in detail. Um, over to the, um, the, this is the left side of the gallery. We have uh, one of the Solaris pieces uh, that I spoke of. Um, this, is, this is a green Solaris. And uh, it's, it's a, this one's, uh, it's, I think it's, this is a, a 48 by 48 piece inches and then there's about uh, almost like a half an inch to three quarters inches of resin with the glitter um, embedded in so you have this kind of lo-fi depth to these and as you move across them as the viewer as you look they change they shift the color shift you'll see different colors come into play because of the layers of the glitter and on um, going back to the right or more on the left over here, <coughs> we'll look at this work <coughs> further on. Two, this is um, entitled Red Star. Uh, moving towards the back of the gallery, we have the wishing machine on the left, which is a series of spinning gold columns, um, these kind of mobile columns with a spinning horse skull underneath. Uh, the Wishing Machine is taken, uh, the title's taken directly from the novel, The Roadside Picnic, which um, is, I, I'd say there's a number of, uh, uh, I'd say, <coughs> uh, actual um, uh, characters sometimes, images and objects that uh, are, are woven within the work. And then uh, in the far, uh, in the far, uh, and to the right and sort of the far end of the gallery here, um, we have the Vanishing Points, which is another rotating sculpture. We have lots of rotation again in this, uh, in this exhibition. And we have the video, uh, the video which is called Zero Gravity, Nostalgia for Earth is playing behind it. And I thought there was again, some beautiful moments that happened between the uh, moving sculpture and uh, the moving image. The, one of the really interesting things for me uh, in regarding this exhibition for the first time, I was able to see the work from above and a number of pieces operated in a very different way within the exhibition. Um, and I think it gave particular pieces uh, a, a vantage point that the public, the viewership didn't have before and it just added really a kind of other dimension and experience to the work. And I was incredibly uh, happy, uh, you know, as, as the way this turned out within the exhibition. This was also one of uh, the architectural, uh, I would say, experiences that I was looking forward to working with, giving the work a different opportunity uh, to see from this point, because usually you don't have this um, above uh, vantage point from the balcony within the gallery. Um, so for this, you could see the mirrored uh, heads within the wolves below. And this piece was created in a custom way for this exhibition, understanding that you could see it from above. And you then, so you see the ball reflected in their mirrored heads or their necks, and you see the language, the, the phrase, um, reflected as well, that the fairy tale is now a reality. <coughs> you also see uh, the way the light is spinning on the horses and, uh, and also within the, uh, the wishing machine horse skull. So you have some incredible, I'd say, vantage point experiences within the gallery. Uh, this is another shifter piece. Uh, a, a number of these refractive pieces are the term, or the title is shifter. And that is uh, in connection to the viewer's experience of these works where you, it, the piece literally shifts in color, also in what you're seeing as you move across 
the, in, as you walk from one side, the left to the right or the right to the left with the work, and you're seeing different shapes emerge too because of the dichroic films. You can look at these straight on, but there's actually probably a hundred different images that you can see depending on where you stand and you're, you're viewing this particular work. The colors are constantly changing. And I said, as I said earlier, there's other dichroic shapes that are cut out with the dichroic films that create different ge geometric um, uh, constructs on, on the work. Uh, you, within this work, <coughs> you're seeing the white horse motif that's used often. There is, there is a horse uh, within the video uh, and also within the uh, Vanishing Point sculpture. The white horse in my work is a, again, a visual motif uh, that has a kind of duality within it. And I think of the horse both as within a, many Slavic and Russian cultures, the white horse is uh, an image of dream, of positive dreams, of dreams that will come true, of hopes and dreams that one day will come true. Uh, but the white horse also in a number of cultures stands for the fourth horseman of the apocalypse and the white horse, the, um, the pale rider. And uh, within a, a video that was also included in the exhibition, Surmount on Tomorrow's Rising, the white horse has a, it takes on that presence of both um, a kind of Russian Slavic dream, but at the same time, it's also the pale rider, sort of the, the, the coming of the apocalypse. Uh, within this image, it's uh, a little, I'd say it's a little bit on the darker side, uh, but where you have inversion, I use a lot of inversion in my work as a motif too. You'll see sculptures that are upside down, imagery within the collage that are upside down. And that is, uh, uh, really is the world is upside down and it, it takes on this, perhaps a nefarious meeting, um, things are not necessarily as, as they seem. So there's different ways to, uh, taken in regard inversion within work, but within my work, there's that. And set against inversion, there's a lot of ascent, there's a lot of levitation. So in this work, we can see that this sort of crystal egg form and uh, the universe upside down, that's also another crystal ball. I use crystal balls in my work from time to time. Um, but again, the world is literally upside down within this collage um, uh, action. Uh, the crystal ball, which is just below the egg, is, is also, a, it's a repeated image that I use. It's an important image for me. Uh, it's the first image that I took uh, when I traveled to Moscow in 2013 for the Moscow Biennial. And I was uh, immediately, I was in, uh, put into, into an apartment where I was staying and uh, the artists that had this apartment had a crystal ball uh, in the window and what it was looking out on was all of Moscow. And so actually within that ball is the cityscape of Moscow. So kind of, and, I, and with these works, I feel like the more you look, the more you see. Uh, you can, it, there's a kind of micro macro experience uh, within these works. Um, this uh, work, as I mentioned before, this is called Red Star, <coughs> Sela Krasna, and there is a peacock alive, uh, or was live, but a taxidermy peacock uh, on top of this. Uh, birds uh, in my work, uh, again, raptors, and I've used peacocks in the past as well, are um, to some extent, I, I view them as kind of oracles, as witnesses to history, um, but they're without judgment. Um, uh, the peacock is also a kind of spiritual bird. It's, it is regarded as, again, a kind of positive, I'd say, sort of spirituality. The white animal, the white animal has a kind of a purity to it, um, but it often speaks to kind of, again, hopes and dreams. I look at this sort of using a peacock or a white horse or a, a white peacock or a white dove uh, in a kind of future trajectory. And that, that's how I, I, I view uh, these animals when I use them um, in my work. But it's perched on this red pillar, a mirrored pillar that is also, uh, I'm sort of deconstructing. Again, there's a lot of fracturing within the exhibition, within the collages, but it's sort of, it's one point of a star. 
is, is my thinking within this work. And you have to move around the work uh, as well. So you, it says red on one side and then, uh, or star, and then red, it's on then red, and then the star, red star on the uh, star on the other side. Uh, there's also a small photograph that is cantilevered off of the wall. The museum crew, I just have to do a big shout out to the Russian Museum of Arts crew. You guys did an amazing job and um, it was such a pleasure to work with everyone on the staff. So they, um, they went above and beyond and uh, they really uh, installed the work uh, so that it, it took on a, a kind of uh, a very poetic presence, I would say, within the space. Uh, but within this work, this is uh, the title of this work is Red Star um, in Memory of um, uh, Kormilov. And uh, he, so to go back here, we'll look at uh, other detailed images, but he was a cosmonaut um, and Kormilov crashed, uh, unfortunately, into space or, or you know, onto Earth from space. And the image is of uh, the Soviet officials at that time viewing the remains of his body. I don't show you the remains of his body. I've collaged over an image that was declassified. Now, now you can see it, you can see it online if you, if you want to look it up. Um, but the, they're looking actually at his charred, charred remains. So I'm choosing to cover that up in a kind of memory piece towards him. And again, it's refracting light. So, it's, it's uh, through photographs, through video. I, I'm also interested in this uh, concept that the filmmaker Guy Madden uh, has talked about. And he, I, I think with, within film theory, uh, there's different conversations about how do you bring back those that have passed? How do you bring back the dead through the moving image and through photography? Um, and that's also, a theme within Russian cosmism. So I'm I'm working with different thoughts on this this subject matter. In Russian cosmism, one of the uh, original, uh, I'd say, philosophies or concepts uh, going back to the 19th century, and I think it's interesting that these ideas uh, were that came came into. Uh, conversation and consciousness and were created in the latter half of the 19th century uh, before there was space travel, but worlds that were without gravity. Um, and within cosmism, it was that there'd be this spaceship Earth and that it's on some other planet in the future, uh, the human race would uh, migrate, there would be an exodus off of Earth and all of humanity from, I don't know, the beginning of time, depending on, on who you read, uh, would uh, be res resurrected. There would be a, a great colossal resurrection of those that had ever lived. Um, it's, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I, I can't say I follow that um, uh, literally or that I believe in it, but I think that there is something in terms of how we regard that it's relative, right? Because we are uh, in a time right now where there is cryogenics, uh, DNA. So maybe, you know, everyone that had ever lived actually could be uh, resurrected with, the, with, the, with, uh, with contemporary science. So again, it's, it's how you actually think about it. And I think that that's a very interesting uh, question and thought uh, in terms of regarding Russian cosmism. Now, um, to go back to um, the history of Russian cosmism, that term really came to in the uh, early 90s. Uh, but the tenets, the train of thought of Russian cosmism in terms of uh, theology, science, the arts, uh, science fiction, literature, that has been an ongoing, again, Russian train of thought um, throughout the latter half of the 19th century, uh, starting with Sikorsky uh, in, 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 in um, the latter half of the 19th century. And he was a uh, philosopher, a theologian. And, and then also this, there was an immediate conversation with um, science, scientists at that time. So I, I think that, that they were also, I think, very ahead of their time because now we, we do have uh, conversations and we have artistic science, scientific practices where art and science has 
absolutely connected and there are collaborators within that. But um, as an artist looking, looking back into time, I'm like, this was happening in the 19th century to some extent too. And then we have the supremacist movement um, in the early half of the 20th century, uh, victory over the sun. And we have Malevich's Black Square, which is also responding uh, to, again, this Russian cosmism, the, this, this train of thought. Uh, the Solaris pieces, um, again, on reflective surfaces, that reflection, that black, sort of black mirror aspect is really important to me. So you can see a little bit of that within this photograph. And um, it's just, it's sort of, you become sort of perhaps hypnotized, uh, but there's this kind of movement in and out of, of the work. And this work is uh, 48 inches by 48 inches. More of the uh, collage elements. You can see there's there's planets. There's also uh, images that uh, from photographs I took directly working with the Museum of Cosmonautics in Moscow and their amazing team of curators. Um, and I was uh, able to go and film and photograph the interiors of Galina Balashova's work. Galina Balashova is um, regarded as the uh, architect and designer to the Soviet space program. She uh, designed these incredible interiors. I also uh, I critique the interiors in that there's a kind of female sensibility that I'm interested in, uh, juxtaposed from, I'd say, the, the US, the, the more the German, um, the, you know, the Von Braun rockets, which are very, I'd say there, there's more of a masculine quality, battleship gray, very hard surfaces and steel surfaces. But she also had um, a concept, a philosophy in her work that um, the cosmonauts needed to be sort of kind of grounded in their, uh, in their space capsules and that there was an understanding that even though you were in a gravityless you, you know, environment, that there was some semblance of a ground, we'll say, and, uh, and above, a sort of a above and a below. And she did that through color coding, either blue tops, green bottoms, kind of earth tones, these sort of beautiful sort of like light creams, ochres, almost peach colors. And she also um, had a, a philosophy that they, to some extent, were dachas. And it was a kind of, it was like a home away a home, but somewhere where you go, but you return to earth. And that there needed to be a memory of earth, thus uh, the title from the show, it, the, the, the title memory of earth is really coming from Galina Balashova's uh, philosophy that you go away uh, in the, the, the capsule, um, but she included in her designs uh, very small landscape paintings. Some were her own paintings, her own memories of her childhood uh, lakes and forests that she would go to. And I think that's such an interesting detail in addition to having this experience in space. But to, again, remember where you're, you're coming from, remembering the planet Earth, even when you're, when you're there. Um, uh, another, again, this kind of inversion, that's including Lenin's tomb. You're seeing uh, monuments to Gargarin that are turned upside down. Some other images from the Hermitage with sculptures that have wings, um, sort of a trajectory towards uh, space. Uh, the horse skull, which you, you is also a part of the sculpture. Um, this is one of my favorites and became the signature piece for the um, exhibition. You also have uh, the, the photograph or the, the watercolor, the photograph of the watercolor below is of uh, one of uh, Balashova's uh, watercolors with um, and actually an image of my pink cube sculpture over it, but cut out in, in a kind of opposite, uh, the negative black, black velvet space. You have uh, some of the Suez capsules on the sides, also uh, some of these flower images that were uh, also included in uh, some of the, the Suez capsule designs for interior um, pictures. Uh, <coughs> this, is, uh, this is actually an American um, astronaut. So again, within these, you'll see a kind of tension to the space race. There's both American and Soviet uh, space imagery. And within the video, uh, uh, zero gravity uh, memories of Earth, 
that I'm I'm presenting both um, both sides of I'd say the space race, but also through a female lens and uh, female again Balashova's designs, and then also the uh, spaceship uh, or the the, the Challenger uh, space shuttle uh, crash with Christy McCullough. And so in a kind of memory and a celebration of um, both astronauts and cosmonauts who um, you know, gave, gave their life towards space exploration. Uh, within this uh, collage, um, in, there's particular details. One, the one that I'll point out is the Bruegel painting above uh, inverted, and that's taken di directly, it's kind of a direct, uh, a sort of comment on Andrei Tarkovsky's film Solaris. And there's one of my favorite scenes is one of his ecstasy scenes where the, um, where the uh, cosmonaut and his, um, the apparition of his um, ex-wife, uh, she, she comes back and uh, they're floating. But in the background, as Tarkovsky usually does, there's art history informants and he has these Bruegel paintings uh, in the background um, of this particular cinematic scene. Um, and, and then we also have some of Balashova's um, sort of these new takes on interiors on the bottom. Uh, this, is, this is a TMAP piece again. I'm going to move a little bit quickly here because I know we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, this is a, a, a key piece within the installation uh, called The Visitors. And the term the visitors uh, comes from uh, a roadside picnic. Again, that's a term that is used in the novel, the science fiction novel, as, uh, for, for those that go, go into the zone. And then um, you have this, there is a resurrection that happens in the book in terms of these, well, you could say sort of zombie, but the, the dead come back and they come back uh, into the the world that is out of the zone, and uh, so I, I I just reread this novel again, and he's sort of pointing out the particular uh, cos points of cosmism within the novel. Uh, another aspect about that novel that um, that is iterated out throughout the work is sort of this this idea of silver threads. So you'll see like this you'll see silver threads in, in my work too. There's within Rising, for instance, <clears throat> but this kind of light refraction and, and the silver threads. But what this work, The visitor, the Visitors is, is it, um, it's comprised of, uh, I think we, we had, um, I think it was 80, I, I might be corrected. There's, there's, different, there's different numbers depending on the construct uh, for the gallery, but um, 80 different names of uh, philosophers, artists, theologians, writers, musicians, politicians, um, if I'm forgetting anybody here, scientists, engineers, uh, cosmonauts, uh, that uh, contributed uh, to, this, to this, this idea of Russian cosmism, either liter literally throughout their work or they were responding uh, to the work and uh, the, the idea of Russian cosmism in some way. Um, there's also, I would say, for those that uh, visit the museum, there's there's a, um, a key, uh, so you can go you can go through, and all the names are listed, and uh, you can you can you can you can figure out who it, it deciphers um, what what the individual did. So this, the, the, for the instance, in this work, it's starting from the latter half of the 19th century, and it goes all the way up into the uh, current current times. And it, I would say it, it starts with scientists and it, it ends with artists. So, um, so that's, that's, that's another sort of, I'd say the arc of the work. Uh, this is the vanishing points. And um, this is a rotating horse sculpture and uh, that has a mirrored head. So it's reflecting off and refracting the video itself. The video behind is the zero gravity memories of earth which again shows interiors of Galina Balashova's work uh, that uh, was uh, that came out. For, I'm, I've I've worked at the Museum of Cosmonautics in Moscow again, and they've given me the the access to their archives, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but the, bringing these two um, works together uh, was uh, kind of an amazing 
uh, sort of, a, again, this epiphany or the surprise within the museum that worked well within the architecture. And another thing that happened is the horse shadow that happens above uh, and around uh, becomes kind of like a star constellation. So I thought it was, it was, it was a beautiful sort of a, sort of a two point, Oh, version of, of the sculpture in some way. Here you can see it, but it's constantly moving. And uh, a funny kind of uncanny thing is that the horse actually moves rhythmically to the music of the video, which is um, Anna Germain. So it's a Russian pop music uh, regarding the space race. Um, and then this is another piece that's in rotation, the wishing machine, uh, which is a nod to, again, the roadside picnic and the a golden orb, the wishing machine. So uh, within Solaris and um, a roadside picnic, I, I think it's interesting that there are these objects that bring back the, the users or the, the whoever in, you know, sort of interacts with these uh, particular, the spaceship, the planet the golden orb, um, your wishes come true, but be careful what you wish for. So that, that's, that's a kind of theme. And I, I think about that theme also in terms of the 20th century in Russia, the space race, utopia, your sort of utopic promises, and that um, space, this trajectory, this sort of promise or hope of space was something that uh, kept uh, the well, actually with, with, with the Soviet, Russian and Soviet times, it, it sort of kept uh, a promise again, alive in some way. Um, can, I can talk further about that. But with this piece, you have three, again, it's a kind of troika uh, and they're, they're spinning. Um, and uh, underneath it is a, a spinning platform, a gold platform with a horse skull on it and within the horse skull, uh, as you look closer and closer, there's other reflective uh, steel orbs. And then if you keep going closer, the eye is actually a crystal ball that has a, a star constellation or a cosmos within it. So again, this micro macro uh, experience that is within the work. And, and I think that that's also coming from the, the act of looking at telescopes, the way we, we look at space, the way we, we um, understand space on Earth. Um, this is a piece called uh, Rising. And again, this kind of inversion, uh, it, there's something maybe a little monstrous about it. <coughs> uh, within the roadside picnic, you know, there's the character, the monkey, which is a, a kind of a human monkey girl, <laughs> and, uh, I've, but I've been thinking about uh, that that character recently uh, with the reread. Uh, but with this piece, also you have these like silver threads that are holding on again these dichroic crystals. So there's this material language that connects this work to the uh, collage works, and you're also seeing when you walk up on top of this piece the gaze of the coyote meets you. So there's this direct kind of regard between the viewer and the sculpture. Um, and you have these crystals falling out of its head, which is uh, again, a, a kind of um, uh, an, an informant from stories like the roadside picnic and these, these sort of webs and these sort of crystal-like formats that, that uh, follow you into the world outside of the zone. And then when you look into the mirrored uh, pentagon shape below, the sculpture's reflection seems to be throwing, coming like right out at you. So again, there's, there's this play with refraction and reflection within the work. We've seen some of these here. We'll go back a little bit. And, and here we have uh, Fedorov, who was one of the original uh, thinkers, uh, theologian, philosopher of uh, Russian cosmism. And let's see what else we have. I think, I, think, I think that's it, that's all I have. So we'll go back. And if there's any questions, comments, I'm happy uh, to answer. I think, I think we have uh, about five minutes left. Masha, let me know if, um, if, if, we, if we have extra time. Otherwise, uh, happy to take questions and comments now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, we have uh, another five, 10 minutes if there are questions and uh, you 
those who are present are most welcome to uh, type them in the chat box and then Andrea and I we will uh, respond to them. And uh, so the, my, my question is um, to Andrea uh, about the um, direction she is taking. So because it's futurist art, for me, Andrea's art belongs to a bigger umbrella um, movement uh, of futurism that's been around for at least a hundred years, if not more. And uh, so, where where is it taking you? That's that 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 that's that, that's a great that's a great question. And you you've mentioned it to me um, in, in part of our conversations before. And it's interesting in that I haven't regarded my work in that way, but I also can't, I can't, I can't um, deny it. And I have to, I think I need to, I need to own that a little bit. And I think of my work um, as, I do think of my work in, in terms of a trajectory towards the future. Uh, and I, I think right now, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in, the most recent findings um, from the Mars rovers uh, within the video work, we, we, didn't, we didn't show images of the video, um, but I was actually using, it was that week, it was, it, it's where the present and the future is actually meeting in real time, in real time with the art making. And I think this was also a first for me in that um, the week that we were finishing, we were finishing the editing the video the um, images came across, you know, the media, the public media, and the, I, I, I peruse the, the NASA site often, and a few video images. So we were able to incorporate those into the video at the very last minute. But what it did is it gave the video a, it, it, gave, it was grounded in reality too. The, the video is absolutely fantasy, science fiction, and I, want to very much continue to work within that language regarding science fiction. Um, I, for, for this video, I, I'm interested now in creating my own science fiction with an artwork as well. Um, but um, integrating uh, science in real time as much as possible. And uh, again, working with the uh, Museum of Cosmonautics I'm looking forward to working uh, with them uh, on, on future work as well. And uh, the wonderful uh, opportunities that uh, working with a science museum has because you have immediate access. In many cases, I've, um, I've, I've talked to cosmonauts firsthand. I've had tea with them and talking to them about what, what is it actually like to be on the space station and um, physically, and what, what what do you see happening in, in, in the near future? So to have, uh, I would say, these primary resource opportunities um, as an artist are are important, and I feel very again very grateful that I, I I have these opportunities, and I want to integrate that more into the work. But I'm um, excited to work on uh, more video more video pieces in the near future. And regarding the work as uh, futurism, I think that's something that's important to also embrace. And thinking about futurism, we talk about cycles. I talk about cycles in my work, both in sort of science fiction and science. Um, but also, I think that's a really important question right now in the time we are like, what is, what is if there's like a new futurism uh, what is the futurism within 2021? Uh, I think within our uh, history, we went through a period, uh, you know, in the last, uh, I'd say going back from the late 90s to the, you know, the mid 2000s, where we were, there was, it was really sort of like a new surrealism and the, like a surrealism movement. There are reasons why politically, uh, you know, within, within our society, we, we, different eras or different, uh, you know, movements of art happen. And then I feel like we're in a time where 
futurism. There's there's perhaps a new futurism. So you're you're maybe you're, maybe, <laughs> you're, you're right on it, Masha. I th I think with um where where sort of a, a new futurism is right mm -hmm. now within the artistic conversation. Uh, yeah. But I I hope to continue that uh, that uh, trajectory and that language uh, throughout my work and uh, where we are in a time where artists um, you know more often now are, are working with directly with scientists um, I I'm, I'm hoping to continue to have that within my work but at the same time it's very important for me as a visual artist. Um, now it's, I'm, but to put, put the poetics and the artwork first. So I'm perhaps, perhaps I'm, I'm giving a, a kind of, I, I'd say a, a, a bias there, but there's, there's, uh, there's work that's very, it's like art and science, art and technology, but I'm also very leery of where the art gets lost within the conversation of technology and science. And so it's like, where is that balance? Uh, within the work, and I, um, I'm cognizant of that. And within my own work, I want to make sure to keep the language of the artist, the poetics. I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that you know, absolutely present. Thank you. And we actually got one question. It's uh, related to the one you were just answering. Uh, so Russian cosmism has a long past historically and yet it addresses issues and dreams of the future. Where is cosmism now in the present? How many and what kind of artists other than yourself are working with this idea? Great question. Uh, I would say right now, um, I, I think cosmin, cosmism has really been embraced by the visual arts community. Um, I, I uh, is and within the the piece the visitors uh, it, it sort of the end I would say with we'll, we'll say within it's it's also a kind of linear timeline <laughs> um, within the the latter I'd say quarter there is names of particular contemporary artists one that I'll bring up and I was I feel very uh, fortunate to recently have been in an exhibition with Anton Vodokal. Uh, who's also, uh, he's, he's the creator of Eflux, which is a uh, visual arts uh, journal of art and philosophy. Um, but uh, I was uh, recently in the Cosmos and Chaos uh, exhibition at the uh, general staff building at the Hermitage uh, that was curated by Sciland and they're a media um, arts group. Vika Lushkina was the curator on this project and um, it was a, a really just a, a, a fabulous video uh, exhibition and it included Anton Vodokal. And Anton Vodokal, uh, he's, he's, he's based in, I believe, Moscow and Berlin now, someone could correct me on that. Uh, but he, uh, within I'd say the last decade, is an artist who really uh, brought cosmism into a critical conversation, a very serious conversation within the contemporary art world. Um, but there, I, I'd say more, more off, um, I would say there's probably more Russian artists working with this subject matter. Um, but uh, I, and I, and I think part of, I, I'd, I'd say, one of the positions I, I thought of when I when I when I realized like the, the work and, and I'd say that the the term Russian cosmism, I took that on within my work based on my work in Russia and having Russian artists critique my work and um, they came out and said, well, you know, really, you know, have you thought about this this kind of philosophy because your work is about this this work you've been doing for the last you know, 20 years, it's like, do you understand that you're really talking about this mm -hmm. within the work? And I, I would say that I would not have um, brought, uh, brought that, that, that philosophy into my work if it, if it wasn't for my work in Russia and having uh, various Russian art artists and people in my community there um, uh, call, call that out. I've had great conversations, um, but there, there's, there's, um, so with, within, I, I'd say one of the main artists out of uh, Russia right now, or someone who's really worked with this uh, concept is, is, is Anton Vodokal. Um, but uh, it, it's, I, I think we could go back throughout the, the 60s. 
there's there's various artists that have been using the ideas of Russian cosmism uh, within their work. Um, so it's uh, it, it, I don't I wouldn't say it's it's new um, in Russia, but I think within the Western world, uh, this this concept is perhaps new. And I, I think part of my positioning here in the United States as as an American artist uh, was to bring this concept into the contemporary art conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. And Anton Vidoko has an excellent website where he has the timeline of the cosmos uh, developments and various thinkers and uh, just uh, historical figure, cultural figures that contributed to it. Yeah, it's just an excellent website. But also the ideas of cosmism are Kind of, I find them close to transhumanism, which is a Western development. So what do you think about it? Transhumanism and cosmism. Do you embrace transhumanism as part of your overall uh, mentality on this? I, I, I think it, I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I, I would say not, not, I would say not in a, in a primary way, but I would say it's, it's very difficult. I think it is absolutely within the work. And that it's, I think it's very difficult to, to make work about cosmism without having that conversation as part of it. Um, within uh, the images, uh, I'd say using uh, the kind of uh, human images, the way I use human images within the work, it, it's very, it, it, is, it is a trans humanism, I would say use of, use of the image where we, where we the, there, there is a kind of I don't know if I'd say like soullessness, but there's a question as to the life: is it a is it is it a resurrected life? Um, is it an AI life? Um, so uh, I, I think that that you, it's it's hard to it's hard to work with one and not not have part of that conversation within it. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm trying to answer the this question uh, and someone wants to, and I hope to share it with everyone, the name of Anton Vidokal and his... Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's Vidokal is spelled with a K and this yes. is his Eflux uh, publication. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, yeah, I would say thank, thanks for bringing that up, Masha, because that timeline um, is excellent, and if 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 anyone in the audience wants to, you know, very, very not, I don't say quickly, but also it's just it's 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 very concise, and it it also uh, brings in um, a, a number of other I would say contemporary artists that that are working with this this theme as well. But uh, it, there's. Um, it, there's there's also a number of other there's other publications that Eflux has put out actually the not to not to plug but I will plug the uh, Russian Museum of Art uh, gift shop and within your gift shop you're carrying uh, one of the Eflux uh, Cosmism uh, writing uh, writing so the a series of essays and uh, so if anyone is visiting the Russian Museum of Art bookstore uh, there there's a couple of great books that you have on Cosmism, but there is an Eflux publication that I saw in the bookstore. Yeah, also I think uh, Anton created uh, a film trilogy, uh, Immortality for, for All, have you? Do yeah. you know anything about it? Yes, yes, that's, um, and, and so that, that work was recently um, at the Hermita, the Hermit, the Chaos, mm -hmm. Cosmos and Chaos exhibition. So that is a, a trilogy. I haven't I haven't seen the entire trilogy. I, I would I, I want to, um, but it it also it 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 addresses this, this idea of resurrection in in, in, a, in a very in, in an interesting way. Um, so I, yeah. I, re I recommend. Yeah, I absolutely recommend reviewing. Look looking at at the website, the Eflux site. And, uh, and, and if you can see the video, I'm, I'm not sure actually how to view the video online, if, if that's possible. Um, yeah, but I, I posted the um, correct spelling for Anton's name, also a link to his 
online journal and a link within his journal to the timeline of Russian cosmism, which is really excellent and helpful and gives a starting point for your own research. And uh, it's an entirely fascinating theme and philosophy. I'm so glad that Andrea is bringing this uh, unique school of thought into uh, the American art scene. And also not just the art scene, but the scene for you know discussions of these connecting points between our cultures of past, present, and the future. Well, uh, with that, I would like to thank Andrea. And if we don't have any more questions, um, I'm uh, ready to wrap up our discussion. Please, if you have questions, email the museum. You can email me directly. If you would like to connect with Andrea, I will definitely connect uh, you uh, if you have more questions and comments. Otherwise, please come to the museum to look at the exhibition because museums are about uh, actual art pieces. No screen, no photograph, no video can um, substitute for the actual presence of you yourself within your body next to an art piece. The way we are, uh, we, when we go to a museum, the way we look uh, at these art pieces and the way we feel and inhabit the this spa this space, the same space as an art piece, the way we look at how light, uh, light is reflected, the way we can move around this piece because we can move freely uh, through the museum, unlike when we are at the computer. We are in the position of, in a way, a school child. We are infantilized by the screen, while in the museum we can take a more active part and we can feel and smell and be a lot more than we are when we are looking at the computer screen. Please come to the museum. They are open seven days a week. Consider becoming a member uh, we have more exciting exhibitions in the future, and I hope uh, probably in four or five years when Andrea creates more of Cosmos and Futurist works, we will have another collaborative project with her. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Would you like to have any comments? Uh, uh, I just... Uh, Thank you, Masha. Thank you, Russian Museum of Art. It's been an absolute, I'd say dream come true. I have to say, I, I, and another plug, this is my favorite. Sorry, other museums in Minneapolis, but you are my favorite museum and you have been. It's been a real, I feel that it's a gem, a kind of oasis within Minneapolis. And on a day like today, I know there's a, a snow, uh, there's a snow emergency perhaps, but uh, as I told Masha when I walked in, this was my favorite day when I lived here. This the favorite kind of day to come to this museum because it was there's something that is a kind of sanctuary. It is in a church, but to go off of, also to continue what what Masha said to see work in person, um, paintings, sculpture, but with this show too, there are conversations between the the works as they are put together in the exhibition. We can show you images video walkthroughs, but there's something about experiencing this in the real time, within the time that you give the work to, to, to view it, to understand it, to experience it. It is an experiential, overall, it's an experiential installation. And I would just hope that if you, if you can visit in person, um, it's, 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 a, it's a show that, that, uh, that you, you get the full effect if you, if you visit in person and you see the connections and the experience and the, the light play and the reflection play and how you are within the work too, within the yeah. exhibition. So thank, thank you everybody that made this possible. Yeah, thank you everybody for attending. And with that, I would like to say bye-bye for today. See you online and in the museum and please drive safely or do not drive at all. Bye. <laughs>